We're so glad you plugged in today online at Cornerstone Church. Each message is designed to strengthen your walk with Christ. However, we do encourage you to be a part of a loving church home where you can build real relationships with real people and grow in your walk with Christ. We hope this message blesses you and we can't wait to see you next weekend. Good morning again. We're still doing the one man show thing, no worries. All is well. Um, if you have your Bibles, would you please join with me um, in turning to John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. That's John 15, verses 1 through 8. And while you're doing that, I just want to make a quick announcement. <clears throat> in the beginning of the year, um, I told you that there was a short season where I was going to be overseeing the youth ministry, our Cornerstone students. Um, and last week, we actually uh, found uh, that person and announced to the students who that person was, who's going to be overseeing that ministry. Um, and I just, uh, I just, I can't say enough about this person. We just know that she loves people. She loves kids and she loves God. And so her name is Jen Hall. Um, she is the, yeah. Uh, she is the director of our student ministries. I, I guess as a whole now, she was seeing, overseeing Kids Quest um, from our toddlers um, and up, and now she's seeing sixth grade all the way up through 12th grade. Um, and so if you have a grandchild, uh, grandbabies, or if you have a student that, or, or a son and daughter that is in sixth grade um, all the way to 12th grade, I want to encourage you to um, bring them on Thursday night starting at 7 o'clock. It ends at 8.30. Um, and bring them a little early because we like to play games and we like to play spike ball and all that other stuff. It's, it's really a lot of fun. So I just wanted to let you guys know that, that, that I am not no longer that person, that it would be Jen Hall. Okay. So last week uh, we looked at the three uh, I am statements that Jesus made in response to Thomas. Um, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. And so we are in a series right now called Going Deeper. Going deeper and knowing who Jesus is. Not who he was, but who he is. Because our God is alive and he is active within our lives. He's not a was. He's not a past tense. He is an absolute guarantee, definitely is relevant today. Amen? Amen. And so we're going to be looking at what it looks like to go deeper with Jesus and know him um, personally. Starting in John 15, verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is it, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you, Lord, that your presence is here with us. God, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus that we do not have just another regular church service. I'm asking that you would flood this place. I am asking that you would take over my lips and be over my words. I have nothing to say. My words do not bring life, but your words bring eternal, everlasting life. And so I'm asking you, Lord, that you would show up in our lives in a major way here today, that we would be changed forevermore. As we feast on your word, Lord, I'm asking that you soften the hearts and minds of those who are here today, Lord, your sons and daughters, and maybe those who don't even have a relationship with you, that we would make decisions to follow you and to accept you here today. And it's in your son's precious and holy name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Jesus said that I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. And so when we, like any plant or tree or bush, it, it has a root system. And now I, I, I went and tried to study on plants and how they grow and all this. And I, I made it probably within the third word uh, because he's, they're using words like they're this long. I, I completely gave up. Um, so I'm going based off of what I, the basics of what I know. And so a root system plays two purposes. 
The first being that a root system provides nutrients to the plant. The, it provides water and iron, and it goes up into <clears throat> the plant, and it goes through the stalk, it goes into out into the bushes, it goes into the leaves, and eventually it bears fruit. And Jesus said that I am the true vine. I am the life source. Every spiritual, nutritional need that you need in your life, I will provide you. I am the true vine. There is no root there. If there is no root, then there is no life. And if there's no root, then there is no fruit. That rhymed. <laughs> I just caught that. It rhymed. I get inspired by Dr. Seuss. You know how it goes. Uh, Philippians 4.19 says this, And my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And Jesus is saying, look, I am your spiritual nutrition. Everything that you need will come from me. The second <clears throat> is that roots are an anchor. They act as an anchor. Have you ever seen after a hurricane, we live in Florida, so we have hurricanes. Have you ever seen after a hurricane how there's all this destruction and broken trees and all this other stuff over there, but then you look in your yard and you see these little dainty little flowers and weeds and they're, and they're still standing? Have you ever wondered why that is? It's because the roots go deep. Because the roots were acting as an anchor. And in Hebrews 6.19 it says, we have this, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. I hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. Jesus said that I am your anchor in a storm. Jesus said I am a true anchor for your soul. And that, and that is all good and, and, and true of Jesus, but Jesus is also talking to his disciples, and I believe that he has something to say to us here today as well. And so not only is Jesus talking about the certainty of who he is, to his disciples, but he is also talking about what a true believer looks like. And he charged the disciples with a challenge and says, look, if you want to do this and you have to do this in and through me. And I believe that this is the charge and challenge to us today. John 15, 2 says this, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so what is this fruit that Jesus is talking about? You know, if this is your first time with us, uh, Jesus is not saying that we should be cultivating uh, grapes and bananas and apples on our person. We shouldn't be having this stuff growing out of our armpits, right? And what he's saying is, is that it is identifiable to you, okay? And so what, he, what this looks like is, the best way I can break this down is, is if you see an orange hanging off a tree, you know that it is an orange tree, if you see a lemon hanging off of a tree, you know that it is a lemon tree. And so the fruit will tell you what kind of tree that it is. And it's no different with the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit tells other people who we are. The fruit tells other people that we are followers in Jesus, of Jesus Christ. Galatians 5.22 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And so how is, how is this fruit cultivated in our lives? We're told here in verse 4, Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now, that word abide is said seven times within the first uh, eight verses. And so anytime that Jesus is, is saying something over and over and over again, he is trying to get our attention. When he says, truly, truly, I say unto you, and in this case, the word is abide. And abide means to remain, to dwell, to stay attached to. And so if I could use it in a way that some of you would understand when it's cold outside, or when it's raining, or when it's Super Bowl weekend, you abide in your house. You stay in your house, and you don't come to church. I'm just an umpire. I'm just calling it how I see it. 
I love you enough to do so. The key word here is abide. Write this down. Abiding is not something that we do. Abiding is not something that we do. It's how we live. Abiding is not something that we do. It's how we live. And this is one of the biggest problems that is in the church today is that we don't look at God. We don't view Jesus as our life source. Every waking moment, we are, we are being pulled away and we are trusting that our loved one is going to be our source. We're trusting that our job is going to change in finances. Or we're going to be a lot more happier. We turn to everything else and each other and people, places, and things over turning to Jesus. And that's a big problem in the eyes of the Lord. There are mothers out there that, are, that get their sole purpose and their sole joy out of just being a mother. I mean, you're dressing up your, your, your kids and you're taking them to recitals. You take pictures and you're making them lunch and you're, you're trying stuff on and you say, oh, that looks cute. You got a little cute backpack and you're going to drive them to school and, and all that stuff is good and fine. I'm not telling you to neglect your kids or to, to not make memories with your kids. I took my, my daughter to the daddy-daughter dance and we had a great time. She didn't want to dance with me and it hurt my feelings, but I made her dance with me at least for one song. I said, daddy's going to get his dance. So there's nothing wrong with that. But what I am saying is that there's a difference in being a mother and being a mother who is in Jesus. There's a difference between being a business owner and being a business owner in Jesus. There's a difference between being an athlete and an athlete who is in Jesus. You can look at Tim Tebow, for example. And there's a difference between a Christian who wears a cross on his neck, owns a Bible, comes to church, but then lives how he wants to live versus one who actually abides in Jesus. So how does God cultivate this fruit in our lives? I don't have time, I don't have time to go through all of these things, uh, but we're going to touch on three things, that if we would just do these three things and we apply them to our lives, uh, God promises, I'm not promising you nothing, but God promises that you will start to see a fruit in your life. The first one is that it takes humility. It takes humility. Understanding that we cannot do this on our own, understanding that we cannot do this in our own strength. Here in verse 4, Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in in me. And so you see, this is a work that only God can do. This is a work that only sovereign, holy hands can do. We cannot cultivate this kind of fruit in our life. Although we have a role to play in this and we do have work to do, the actual production of this fruit has nothing to do with us. And if you are here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you don't know Jesus, you don't believe Jesus, and you think that you have to get clean before you come to Jesus. And you think that you have to be perfect. And you have some things that you've got to sort out in your life before you come to Jesus. Let me encourage you this way by saying it's not going to happen. You cannot do this on your own. In fact, it is by faith that we are saved, not by works. And so if you think that you're going you're gonna to get clean and you're going to do enough good deeds and you've got you to gotta do better... Before you come to Jesus, it's not going to happen. No one washes a car and details a car and waxes a car and vacuums it and, and gets all the trash out of it and puts the tires shine and puts a little smelly Christmas tree in there and then takes it to the car wash. No, you take it as it is. And Jesus is telling you here today that I will accept you and I want to love you right where you are at. The Bible says to come as you are, because at the end of the day, you are not going to make yourself clean. Listen to what it says in here in verse 3. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. You are made clean through the blood and through the word of Jesus Christ. The second thing is, is you have to believe. You have to believe. When we set our pride aside and we say, you know what, there's something bigger than me. I can't do this on my own. And we come to the throne of grace in our humility. We have to believe. 
John 1, 12 says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. It's, it's believing that Jesus is who he says that he is. The Bible says that we are not to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. In other words, you are going to act on what you believe in. You are going to act on what you believe in. And so if you believe that you're going to go down, you're going to go down. If you believe that you should cuss that person out, you're going to cuss that person out. If you believe that you need drugs, if you, and this one hits me pretty hard because I, I felt this. But if you believe that you need drugs and that they are going to fix your problems, you're just going to be high all day. And you're just going to be high all the time. But if you believe that your life has no purpose and that you need Jesus, then you're going to come to Jesus. And if you believe that you should love your neighbor, then you're going to serve your neighbor. You are going to move and act and think based on what you believe. And the number three is loving God. Jesus said that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Love the Lord your God before you love others. 1 John 4.19 says, we love because he first loved us. And we can only love because of God's example in loving us. I mean, if you pay attention to the fruit of the Spirit, uh, in Galatians 5.22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the first fruit. Now, I personally don't think that this fruit is cultivated in our lives uh, in this particular order that we read it. However, I do believe that love was strategically and perfectly placed where it is in the order of things. Because if we love God first, then we're going to produce joy. And if we love God first, then we're going we're to produce a peace that passes all understanding. And if we love God first, it will produce a patience and a kindness. If we love God first, it will produce a goodness and faithfulness. And if we love God first, then it will produce a self-control and a gentleness that we would never, ever experience outside of him. To love God is to abide in God. Verse 5 says that I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If we look at this lamp here, for example, This lamp has a creator. Somebody created this lamp. They had a design in mind, and they created it, and they manufactured it. And when they created this lamp, they created it with a purpose in mind, to bring light into a dark place. But this lamp, if you just look at it, is nothing more than just metal, glass, plastic, and wire. This, this lamp, as it stands right now, is not operating within its purpose in which it was created to do. Because most of us would agree that at this current state of this lamp's position, it's rendered useless, right? We wouldn't use this lamp because it's not operating within its purpose in which it was created to do. Because this lamp needs, in order to fulfill its purpose, in order for it to fulfill what it was created to do, it needs to be connected. And until it gets connected, it's not going to fulfill its purpose. And I believe today that God is trying to tell us that we need to stay connected because he has a purpose and a plan for your life, but you are not going to achieve it, you are not going to know it unless you stay connected. Because we have to be connected to a power source that we can't get on our own. And if we abide in Jesus, our purpose, his whole, his whole design in which he created us was to be a light in a dark place. And so if you need love and you need to experience more love, you need to grow in love, stay connected. If you need peace and patience, stay connected. 
If you need hope, if you need healing, stay connected. I believe that God is telling us, church, that we need to abide in him, that we need to stay connected. No matter if you're going through the good times or the bad times, we just need to stay connected and, and abide in Jesus. We just need to abide in Jesus. And Jesus said, I am the true vine. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father but by me. My name is Jesus Christ. We need to stay connected. And I know it's, I know it's hard. I experience it myself. Sometimes I get out of balance. It's, it's hard to, to juggle everything that you need to do in life. But if we were to really put first things first and to love God, because this is not a suggestion, this is a command that we bear fruit, that we abide in him, that we love God. This is a commandment. He's not suggesting. He's not asking. He's telling and I think that the church would look so much more beautiful if we would just all come together and just say, you know what, Lord, I need you and I'm just going to abide in you. And before I even start the day, if I have to get up a little earlier, I'm going to spend time with you. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to do whatever I need to make sure I produce a fruit, to put a smile on your face. I wonder what the people's lives would look like within your house. I wonder what the people's lives would look like around you. I wonder what your friends' lives would look like um, when you're hanging out with your friends or the business. Let me tell you something. I have a friend. He's doing 12 years right now. And I uh, became a Christian. I started believing and following Jesus. And, you know, we'd go to his, me and my wife, would go to the house. And uh, they would still drink and they would still act fools and all this other stuff. And, you know, I just loved them. Um, and, and, and I would say no. And he just could not believe this change. In fact, when he went to prison, he wrote me a letter and he said, he said, look, I, I got to ask that you forgive me, man. And, you know, I can't talk to him. So I'm speaking out loud. Like, what do you, what do you mean? For, forgive you. Right. And he says, he said, as I started reading, he says, I, I, I was, I was talking about you behind your back. And this is, a, this is a friend of mine for 12. Well, no, actually going on now 15 years. He says, I was talking about you behind your back. Because I couldn't believe this change. I couldn't believe, I, you know what I mean? I, like I know you. This person that I'm seeing right now, I don't know you. I see this change. And so when he went to prison, he, he said that I, I accepted Jesus. He's accepted Jesus. He's been baptized. And now he says, listen, I, I know I have a Lord and a Savior who loves me. And he's going to get me through this. And he said, thank you for being that for me. And I didn't say not one word. Amen. Are you cultivating a fruit? Are you being uh, an asset to somebody's life? Or are you steering them around the long, or down the wrong road? We are called to live a life that is holy and pleasing unto the Lord. And there are people out there who need what you carry. This whole thing is not about us. It seems the running theme with me that God is speaking to me and that it's just not about you, Josh. It's not about you at all. It's about me. It's about my glory. Now, there's another step, and this is the last point, and then we'll close. There's another, there's another thing that needs to take place. It's very important in the cultivation process that pruning takes place. If you actually go to a vineyard, if you go to a vineyard, uh, the vines, they grow up and out and, they, and they just, they'll just continue to go and go and go. And if you don't, if you don't prune them, which means to cut, if you don't prune them, uh, then they're not going to bear as much fruit as they should. You may have one or two little things of grapes. And so the vine dresser goes in and he, on a regular basis, he, he prunes and he's cutting in order to produce more uh, fruit, a, a more uh, productive harvest, if you will. And now pruning doesn't feel good. It hurts. And so some of you have, uh, have it is actually common in Christian community that we like to give Satan all of the credit for what God is doing in our lives. You, know, you spill your coffee and it's like, oh, Satan's attacking me. You know, I stubbed my toe and Satan's attacking me and, uh, you know, all these little things. And it's just always Satan without ever thinking for one second that maybe God is pruning you 
and wanting to do something in your life. And so we need to stop giving Satan credit for what God is doing in our lives. Pruning hurts. And if you've ever gone through the pruning process, you know it hurts. It doesn't feel good. And you may think that God has rejected you and he doesn't love you and he has turned away his back on you, but in fact, it's, in, it's exactly the opposite. It's because he loves you that he prunes you. And so I don't, I don't know what God needs to prune in your life. Maybe you're going through a pruning now. He's, What's God pruning in your life? Is it, is, it, is it greed? Is it idols? Is it unforgiveness? Maybe it's depression? Is it a lack of love? What is, what is God pruning in your life? Because if you don't know, if you ask him, he'll, he'll definitely show it to you. I know for me, and if you're like me in any sense of the word, God was like, <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, we got work to do. And we're still, <laughs> I'm still, I'm still getting dealt with. We need to understand something that, and hopefully give you more peace about it, I would hope, that you think that maybe when God gets you through something, that the pruning is done, but the reality is, is that we are called to, to produce an abundant harvest, an abundant crop of fruit. And so the pruning is not gonna stop. But you gotta understand that the vine dresser, God, loves you so much to say, I wanna take this away from you. That's not what I had for you, son. That's not what I have for you, daughter. You're not supposed to feel like that. You're not supposed to hate that person. The trimming is never going to stop until we go into the future glory and God makes us like his son, Jesus Christ. And so from, from the day in and day out until the day we get called home or the day we're raptured, whatever comes first, the pruning is not going to stop. Verse 8 says, this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. This is to my Father's glory. And it's not because we're so great, and it's not because we're so awesome, and, and, and God just he puts us on a little pedestal because we're just this most amazing thing. No, it's because he's great. It's because he's awesome. It's because he's amazing. And he wants us to cultivate this fruit to bring him glory. And we need to stop living for ourselves because we need to get out of these people's way. We need to get out of our own way to point people to the way. The less we show of us, the more we can put him on display. It is not about us, although God cares. But if we reposition our minds and say, you know what, God, no matter what comes at me, I'm gonna hold, I'm gonna hold true, I'm gonna abide in you. I'm going to stay true to you to the very end. I want to hear of, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into your father's rest. Don't you? And so what's it going to take? I can't answer that for you. I know, <laughs> I know what that answer is for me, but I can't answer that for you. I can't walk in to the gates with you. We are all going to go by ourselves. I'm not taking my wife. I'm not taking my kid. I'm not taking my phone. I'm not taking my fishing poles. I'm not... I'm going in by myself, and so are you. And we're going to be held on account for the things that we did with Jesus and with the blood and what we didn't. We need to start taking him more serious, church. God is not one to play. He ain't about them games. He's very serious about his word. He's very serious about the things that he says. Every head bowed and every eye closed out of respect for the people who are around you, and out of reverence for the Lord. Jesus said, I am the true vine and you are the branches and God is the vine dresser. Now, shouldn't the vine dresser be able to do what he wants with those branches? 
And so maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ or, or, or maybe you want one, but you just don't know how to go about it. Would you please just raise your hand? All right. I still closed. If you are here today and you have a relationship with Jesus, would you make a declaration today? Because maybe your maybe your light is or maybe your life is not living up to what we're called to live to. Maybe we can abide more. If you want to abide more and you're willing to rearrange your schedule, would you just raise your hand? One, two, three. Hands are going up. Or you may put them down. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for Jesus Christ. I thank you so much for the decisions that were made here today. Father, speak to us individually. Give us the grace to love you more. Give us the grace to believe in you more. Give us the grace to be intentional about you and your word. Father, as we leave here today, Lord, I just ask that you would manifest your spirit in their lives, that we would increase in our love for you on a daily basis. And it's in your hey guys, we're so glad you plugged into this week's message. We want to connect with you. Check us out at cornerstonechurch.co. Can't wait to see you next weekend.